The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can take them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can take them out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Today is what the church calls Good Shepherd Sunday because the word shows up um, in our second reading and also, of course, Christ calling himself the Good Shepherd. Uh, and tomorrow will be Mother's Day, so I'm kind of thrown between do I give a homily on mothers, mothers or do I give a homily on Good Shepherds? I don't know. So, but we're not at Mother's Day yet. So, but I came across something very interesting, and I never really had given it much thought or reflection. Um, this was written by a Cistercian monk who had been a very famous author for many years, and he wrote a tremendous, probably one of the best commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew that I have ever read. Uh, thick, 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 thick volumes. Uh, he wrote it in Greek, and then he had it translated into English, but he kept the Greek verbiage. He kept all the Greek uh, expressions and all of that, even though the Gospel of Matthew was written in Aramaic, but his approach was absolutely magnificent, and it was only a matter of time before he would go into a monastery. Um, after reading his commentaries and things, I have no doubts, he, he literally got fired up by what he was writing and what he was researching and so on and so on, and joined one of the most uh, hardest of all religious communities uh, on the face of the earth, the assertion of a very severe, severe religious life. Uh, we want to complain because it's raining outside or because we got to, you know, we get a couple of rains on our head or uh, drops or because we got to go five minutes in a car to get to church. And the Cistercians, they don't, they don't even talk. They have two hours, I think, on Sunday where they're allowed to talk at lunch. There's no conversation with the other monks, the other brothers. You live in a small, tiny little cell with a crucifix and an image of the Madonna. And you have a little cot and a chair and a little wooden table. You grow your own vegetables. And whatever you don't have, of course, the community supplies. There was a movie out some years ago called Into the Silence, which was about the Cistercian monks. What a beautiful principle. I know for us living in the world, silence is very painful. It's very difficult. We always got to have the, the cell phones on, our computers on, our radios on. Something's got to be on. Otherwise, I can't sleep, I can't think, I can't do this unless I got something going. We never make a really good monk. But over the years, I've had the opportunity to do retreats, uh, which were done in absolute silence when I was in the seminary, an entire week of no speaking. I had to chuckle, though, because a lot of the seminarians didn't know how to be quiet. And all I wanted was silence. By the third day, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to say anything. I just wanted to be quiet. I just wanted to be in the church. I wanted to be close to God, and that was it. But it's hard for us. But anyways, he ended up in a monastery. Um, but this is something that he wrote in his commentary on scripture. And I came across this as I was doing some research work on a good shepherd. Um, and, he, and he says, all of scripture may be said to tend toward the central event of the incarnation of God. As it is expressed in the anthem for the feast of the incarnation. O oh God, you will that your word should assume the full reality of human flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary. A religion whose cornerstone is the mystery of a woman's life-bearing womb. Being receptive to the advances of divine love, the Holy Spirit, 
A religion whose savior is a real man, whose path to salvation never leaves the specificity and density of flesh and bone, cannot help but having its foundation, foundational text, a dramatic story, the poem of love, fear, and exaltation, and the epistle that knits together the body of disciples, cannot help but have and take life from the womb in the church. Happy Mother's Day, huh? For those of you who are mothers. I thought it was a beautiful, beautiful reflection, a beautiful way of looking at things because he's absolutely right. In the end, basically, even St. Bernard of Clairvaux, you know, said that what he'd given to be a fly on the wall. The moment the angel gave it came to this young woman to ask her to be the Theotokos, the God-bearer, to care within her womb, God. He said he would like to have heard that conversation and what that moment must have been like for her. But I think this expresses it pretty well. The entire mystery circles around Mary and her saying yes and allowing herself to be implanted, of course, with the three drops of her pure blood that would form within her in a peanut, a little sized, a little baby Jesus. That's why she had to have pure blood. That's why she had to have no sin. God could not take his nature from a person with a sinful nature. He needed a human being that had no sin. That's why she is the Immaculate Conception, uh, because she had no sin. Now, last week, we talked a little bit. I didn't get a chance to finish my homily last week. Uh, Time-wise, I was running a little bit long. Um, and the diocese has asked me to kind of <laughs> keep it under a thousand words. Now, who pra- I, I don't know of any priest that counts his words when he says them. Unless you've got to calculate and count them as I'm speaking, you're welcome to do so. You can let me know how many words I said. But I'm certainly not going to sit in my rectory and practice my homily and count the words I'm speaking. I can tell you that. You're probably going to think I'm nuts when you come knocking on my door. What is Father doing? You know, but they're telling me, you know, it should keep under a thousand words and, you know, it should only be a quarter of the Mass. And so I went back into the documents, you know, and at the Second Vatican Council, one of my favorite documents, of course, was on the liturgy itself. And the document makes it very clear that the homily has to be a most integral part of the Mass and should take the human being to the altar of God. How am I going to do that with a thousand words or less? Now, you might think maybe a good speaker can do that, and maybe they can. I don't know. Maybe I'm not a good speaker. I don't know. But I'm one of those people that likes to lay the groundwork. I like to lay it out, give you a particular thought, and then I like to expand on it and explain it to you. From the gospel itself, from the word of God. So when you leave here, you will have something to digest. You'll have something in your mind that you can think about. But I know why people are leaving the Catholic Church. Again, there was an article in the newspaper, uh, you know, why Catholics are leaving the Catholic Church and so on and so on. I haven't seen it so much personally, but uh, maybe it's happening in some places, certainly. But part of the problem is the priest doesn't say anything. I've traveled all over the world. I've traveled all over the United States. I've been in churches where I have to scratch my head. That's why my hair is falling out and wonder what, what did he just say? The priest said nothing. He repeated the words of the readings, maybe added a couple of his own words to it, and that was it. No wonder people are hungry for the word of God. No wonder people are hungry for the truth. The human being was made to know the truth and to love it. In everything we do, at the very core essence of what we are as human beings, is to know and to love. And in the end, we were made to know God. And that knowledge takes us to loving Him. That's the idea. I can't do that with a few words, personally. That's just me. 
Now, certainly when I go to Mass, and the priest, as long as he says a valid Mass, of course, you receive the Eucharist, you receive Christ, and all of that. Thanks be to God. Um, but I'd like to think every once in a while when I go to Mass, uh, the priest will have something to say. I remember when I, even before I was in a seminary, I used to go to daily Mass for many years. And I remember in this one particular parish, it was a huge parish, a cathedral parish, and they had a priest there who, was, who they say was very well educated. But I'm not sure the education is even the answer because every time he spoke, he was blowing bubbles. He might as well have one of those soap dishes and go, catch that, will you? You know, because he couldn't understand a word he said. He taught nothing. So basically, what I would do is knowing full well if he was going to say Mass, I would listen very closely to the word that was being proclaimed that particular day or that particular Sunday, and I would draw something from it. I said, Lord, what do you want me to take from this? Since the priest isn't going to feed me, you're going to feed me. What do I take from this? So that's what over the years I've learned to do. But I've never lost that idea. I've always remembered that let's take something from the readings and go through it. So we can understand the word of God a little bit better. Like St. Jerome said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. How many people call themselves Christians today and have no understanding of Christ whatsoever? Because if they did, they'd be sending us the money. And they'd be here in the pews in the Catholic Church, wouldn't they? If they had any sense of understanding of the truth itself. Instead of it always being twisted, the word of God is always twisted. The devil's very clever. He gets people to believe anything and to buy into anything doesn't matter. That's why we have so many different, not only Christian denominations, but we have so many different religions and philosophies on the face of the earth. In India alone, there's over 30 million gods, all man-made. Not a single one of them ever offered to lay down their life for their sheep, for their people. Muhammad never promised to lay down his life for his followers. Confucius didn't. The founder of Zoroastrianism didn't. There's only one God. They made it very clear. He didn't come into the world simply just to be a master over people. But to lay down his life for his sheep. And for that, he gave us his church. And last week, if you remember, we had the gospel reading where, and I know everybody can answer this, but you wouldn't have the complete answer. Because Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me more than these? I got started on it a little bit, but there's more to the story. And I know everyone here can say, well, you know, Jesus denied, I mean, Peter denied Jesus three times, so therefore, Christ asked him three times. It's only part of the issue. Christ was after something much deeper, much more profound in the soul of Peter than simply getting him to say, yeah, you are the Christ. I'm sorry I denied you. But that's the only thing we ever hear about that gospel. And last week, as I began my reflection on my homily on that particular question to Peter, I told you that there was three things that the human being struggles with when he deals with sin. Satan, the world, and the flesh. So Jesus was giving to Peter a particular power to not only overcome the evil one, but to overcome the principles of the world and to overcome the desires of the flesh. As we know, Peter was very impulsive. 
We can almost say he was very emotional. But that was only part of the story. He also gave him at that moment the power to sanctify, to guide, and to govern. The popes used to wear a tiara that had three band, diamond bands on it to express that threefold power that Christ gave to the pope that every pope has to sanctify, to govern, and to guide the sheep of Christ on earth. But that's not even the end of the story either. He was after something much deeper in Peter. He was after the spiritual powers of Peter, which he's also after within each and every one of us. It's a question, like I said last week, that Christ asks all of us probably a thousand times in our lifetime. Do you love me more than your technology? Do you love me more than your computers, your cell phones? Do you love me more than your spouse, your children, and so on? I had a lady one day, and forgive me for saying this because I know it's Mother's Day, but a lady one time came up to me many years ago and she says, I just adore my children. I almost fell to my knees and said, oh, that hurts. We don't adore another human being. We only adore God. We love our children, yes. As children love their parents, yes. We don't adore them. We don't bow down before them. We only do that to God. And I had to remind the lady, please, when you're around me, don't use that word. Adoration belongs to God alone. Not even the Blessed Virgin Mary gets adoration. Only God. But anyways, I digress, so forgive me. The three powers that Jesus was after in Peter have much to do with the denial of the human being, not just Peter, but the human being who denies Christ on three levels within himself. We all have three spiritual faculties which are meant to be transformed by grace. It's called memory, intellect, and will, which corresponds, by the way, to the Holy Trinity. Now, when Peter denied Jesus, at that moment, his memory through fear denied Christ, absolutely. He wasn't part, I'm not his disciple, I don't follow him. A memory lapse. I like to call them Monsignor moments for myself, but either way, he denied him in his memory. He denied him also in his intellect. I don't know him. I'm not with him. And he denied him in his will. The spiritual faculty of man that allows the human being to love what he cannot see. It's not an emotional love. It's not a feeling. It's a spiritual faculty that every human being on the face of the earth has, and we, through grace, sanctifying grace, through beginning in baptism, are given that divine life, that divine grace to transform the way we remember and think about God, the way we know God in our intellect, and the way we love God in our will. That's a process that's supposed to unfold all the days of our lives. And St. Thomas Aquinas said very beautifully so many centuries ago that what is begun here on earth will go on forever in eternity. Think for a moment. Every day, God willing, hopefully, we get to know a little bit something about God. Therefore, as we get to know God, we love him a little bit more. In order to love something, you have to know them. You have to know whatever you're loving. I say them because I'm thinking of computers and the relationships that people have with other people over computers. But you have to know someone or something to love it, really. So it's a faculty that God gave to us when he created Adam, and every human being has it. Grace transforms the memory, intellect, and the will. Now, what do we carry within ourselves? We carry memories of the past. Our past experiences crowd out our memories. What we've done, what we didn't do, what we should have done, 
what we said, what we didn't say. Our memories carry a lot of pain, especially if we were an abused child or abused human being, teenager or whatever. Our memories carry all those things, even though God wants to take it out of our memories. Because as long as these things are there, there's no room for God. The human being can't be sanctified when his mind is crowded out with everything else but God. So the memory now is crowded out with all these things. There's no room for God. The intellect wants to know. So the human being makes every effort in the world to get all the degrees that he possibly can and hang them on his wall because he wants to know. So people gossip because they want to know. They're willing to commit sins because they want to know something about somebody. We were made to know, yes. But we were made to know God above all things. The intellect operates in images. If I say to you, car, you can think of any car. If I say to you, Corvette, you might think of a particular Corvette. But you can't see the whole Corvette in an instant. You've got to go around it like a movie projector with little images. You've got to think at the front end, the side, the rear, the inside, and so on and so on. The intellect thinks in images. Jesus said, I am the image of the Father. He is the intellect of the divine mind of God. He comes to enlighten our minds. But we don't want to be enlightened. We'd rather just go to church and get it over with. When have we ever made an effort on our way to church to look forward to what I'm going to learn today about God? What am I going to learn about God today? How much more closer am I going to get to God today? We don't. Very few people that I know of make that effort. Very few. Maybe you. Raise your hand. Just kidding. But very few people make that effort. We're listening to the radio. Kids are screaming and yelling. Watching movies and so on. We walk in the door and their minds are all over the place. That's why I always tell people when I give my homilies, I have to speak to two people. The physical person that is present and the other, per, uh, the other part of the human being that is a thousand miles away, his mind. He's thinking about what he's going to have for dinner, what he's going to have tomorrow, where he's got to drive, what he's got to do, and so on and so on. So spiritually, he isn't even present to God. Or his memory is occupied with Whatever. I got to take a test tomorrow. I got to think about these things. So now is a good time. Father has got a long, boring homily, so I'm not going to, I'm just going to think about these other things. So instead of allowing the intellect to be filled with the life of Christ, the image of the Word of God, it's filled with everything else but God. All the worldly images. If we're honest with ourselves, we can close our eyes. And say, yeah, that's true. Because it is true. Our intellect is always occupied with something worldly. And if I'm always occupied with something worldly, how can I be occupied with God? So how can I come to church to try to open my mind and my heart to God if everything is crowded out? Then there's a faculty of the will, which is a blind faculty, as we call it. It's a faculty that can only love what it sees in the intellect. And I know what you're thinking, you know, Father, you need to reserve this for class, or maybe you learned this in school. I didn't learn this in school. I read it in the church fathers. And some of the great spiritual authors, even of the modern age, I've learned to understand how the mind works differently and how important it is to the spiritual life. The entire mystery of the spiritual life takes place on the level of the mind. It's what you think that determines what you do. It's what goes on up here that would express itself physically in your life. 
But the will, like I said, is a blind faculty. You can only love the images that I have in my intellect. If I have the image of a Corvette in my intellect, I'm always thinking about it, then I, I'm going to, in my will, I'm going to love a Corvette, and that's just the way it is. You ever seen people who look like their dogs? We all have, right? You know why they look like their dogs? Because their mind is constantly occupied with that animal. It's an image they carry around in their intellect, and the will turns towards it and loves it. So what does the will do? It transforms the human being. We're supposed to be transformed in the image and likeness of Christ. Instead, we're transformed in the image of a dog. I don't even want to say anything about two people who look like each other. They've probably been married for 50 years. I don't know. But I'm just saying... The will is a faculty that is supposed to transform us in the image and likeness of Christ. But in order to do that, we're supposed to have that image in our minds. This is what Jesus was after when he asked Peter, Do you love me more than these? He was talking about his faculties, his spiritual powers, all your memories, everything that is in your intellect. The way you looked at me as a man and a human being, it didn't understand the supernature of what I am. And a will that loved everything else, especially yourself, to preserve yourself, to deny me. That's what Jesus was after. He was after that memory, intellect, and will, and he's after yours and mine as well to transform it and to raise us up. And then we worry about long homilies because we might learn something. But see, I couldn't finish it last week. Because last week I was already at 22 minutes and then people complained because it was too long. You know, but anybody, anybody count my words? Because <laughs> I'd be interested to know. I got to meet with the bishop on Tuesday. I'd be interested to know. Yeah, I spoke about 25,000 words, I think. So, but I'm going to leave it at that. It's a lot to chew on. It's a lot to digest. You might think it's complicated. It's not all that complicated. It's not that complicated. Everyone knows, we all know what a memory, intellect, and a will is because we all have it. It operates within us quite naturally without us even having to think about it. Now, I've given you an understanding of how to fill those spiritual powers. What's supposed to be there? And therefore, if I put there what's supposed to be there, which is given to me by the grace of God, I can be transformed in the image and likeness of Christ. 